selected readings from the book of Hebrews. It says, above the ark were cherubim of glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priest entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way to the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through a greater, more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of blood and goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place for once by, by all for his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctified them so that outwardly clean. How much more then will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offer himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from the acts that led to death so that we may serve a living God. For this reason, Christ is the mediator and of the new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set us free from the sins committed under the first covenant. It says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and that without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure, it enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We must pay, care, we must pay most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and I thank you for your word. It instructs us, teaches us, and gives us such great confidence. Father, I do thank you for the work of your son. And Lord, as we reflected already, asking for you to speak to us, to our innermost being, I pray that as we unfold your word today, that you would be truly glorified and magnified, that we would sit here in awe and wonder of what you have done. And Lord, I pray that it may... Bring us to a place where we can look at life and be courageous, that we can look at life and have purpose and meaning because of what you have done for us. 
So Father, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Eric. I could almost like want him just to stay up here and do an underlay the whole time. It's beautiful. And if you were paying attention as we read through the scripture, you may have noticed that we actually started from chapter 9 and worked our way back to the beginning of the book. And so they say to be able to know something, you can teach it forward and backward. Uh, I'm not saying I know it that completely, but today we're going to study the book of Hebrews from the back to the front. So we're going to have some fun with that. And I think uh, it, it's, it's going to be a, a way for us to embrace Easter in a new way. Pastor Lou talked about how today is Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry of Jesus entering Jerusalem. And I can remember as a kid uh, getting excited about that. Palm Sunday, they'd have us wave the palm branches and, and different things like that on Palm Sunday. And many years we've done that. Of course, we're refraining this year. But you know, as a child, I even remember thinking like, but a week later, he dies on a cross, like kind of scratching my head, like that doesn't seem very triumphant for him just to, in a week later, die on the cross. And Good Friday, how is that good? Jesus dies on that day. Well, today I want to reframe Easter just a little bit in your minds, and I want to reframe the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. He may have entered in Jerusalem, but where he was really looking to go, his final destination wasn't just that city here on earth. He had an eternal destination. And we see that on Good Friday. And so Good Friday's coming. We've got that service. Love for you to come. But between this day and Good Friday, I'm hoping that today's message will help you to reflect on what Christ has done for us and what it means for your life. And so as we look into it, I, as we read through this, we saw a depiction of the Holy of Holies. Some of you may have picked up on that. And I do have some slides that I want to show you because they will help us in a moment. And so if we can pull those up. The first one is a, an overview shot of, of the temple itself, but I really want you to hone in on number nine there. Uh, that is the veil that stood between the, the Holy, the, kind of a general area and then the Holy of Holies. And we got another slide that kind of zooms in a little bit closer. And on that curtain, it was a very, very large curtain, uh, roughly 30 by 30, if you will, four inches thick. A lot of us may have learned about this in Sunday school or at church. It was woven together with crimson and blues and purples, and so it had a, a rich tapestry. And it was four inches thick. So this was a massive curtain. And on that curtain were two angels, standing kind of on either side. And those angels were significant. Uh, we could look at them today almost as if like a uh, do not enter sign because this area behind this curtain is the place where God dwelled. And there is no human who is able to go into that presence and live. And so these angels stand as a reminder saying to you that you are messing with a holy God behind this curtain and you better come behind here prepared and ready to face him and meet him. During the time of Moses and Aaron, they said that God dwelled in there, that he lived in this space, that they could see him, that he manifested himself as a cloud. And so as we go on to the inside of the Holy of Holies, we, we see a couple things. We actually see more angels. So if you can head to the next slide. There were two cherubim that were made of wood. This is the best image I could find. These two angels that would stand on either side of the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that their wingspan was so wide and so vast that one wing of the angel on this side would touch the wall, the two angels would touch in the middle right over the Ark, and then the other angel would complete it. And it was as wide as it is tall, roughly both of them spanning that 30 feet distance, 15 feet tall, or more really, depending on how long your cubit is. But as you read this, you get to get this picture of this magnificent place, this most holy place. And the spot where God dwelled was on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So we have another picture of the Ark. This would be the Ark of the Covenant. And I like this picture because it, it really gets a good picture of the lid. You see the two angels. I actually prefer the one. Have you seen the one where the angels are almost bowing and their wings come across and touch each other? 
I like that one a little bit better, but I couldn't find an image that worked. But this will work for us because if you zoom in, we've got another one that zooms into that center area. That flat space that was right there, that was called the mercy seat. The whole thing was called the atonement cover. And when the priest would go in there on the day of atonement, he would take blood that was not his own after being cleansed himself by the blood of an animal. He would go behind the curtain. And it was so serious, they would tie a rope around this guy's waist because if the Lord wasn't satisfied, he would strike him dead. That was the fear. But he went in there with the blood of goats and he went in there to offer a sacrifice. And so he would take a branch and he would flick blood right onto that center place. Because that center place was symbolic for us of the, to be the place where God dwells. God himself dwelled there. And that's where the, during the time of Moses and Aaron, there was smoke that would rise up from there. The presence of God would be made manifest in a smoke cloud that would bubble up from that center. Now I say these things because I want us to be able to set the stage for what's to come. On the Day of Atonement, they would go there and they would offer blood for the forgiveness of sins. But when we see Jesus, and it says here in, in Hebrews chapter 9, this is what we call essentially, uh, well, in Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to read for you a selected passage. We already read it, but I'm going to read it again to you. And it says, starting in verse 11, we're going to read 11 and 12, and then verse 24. And it says, but when Christ came as high priest of the good, the good things that are now already here, he went through a greater, more perfect tabernacle that is made not with human hands, that is to say, not part of this creation. He did not enter by the means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. It said, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands, only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. And so this is where I want to reframe the triumphal entry. I can remember again as a child learning how Jesus died on the cross and he was dead for three days. They put him in the tomb and on the third day he rose again. And I always wondered, like, where was he really? What did he actually do? Was he just laying there and not doing anything, waiting for the three days to pass, and okay, now I can come back to life? I am convinced more than ever that I know exactly what he did the moment he died. And we get a picture of it in Matthew chapter 27, verses 50 and 51, and I'm just gonna read them for you. I don't have them on there. It says this, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, He cried out in a loud voice and he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. This thick, massive curtain cut right in two. I am convinced that this was the triumphal entry that we've all been waiting for, for all of mankind, for all of history, throughout all time. The blood of goats and bulls were only a placeholder for the one who would come here and live a sinless life that would sacrifice his life and shed his blood, blood that would be accepted by God. And I believe what happened at the moment when he gave up his spirit, he marched straight into heaven. We looked and saw how our earthly temple is only a copy of the heavenly one. We've looked and we've read a couple times how he did not enter into the earthly temple, but he went into the temple on high, the one that was in heaven. And I can just imagine the scene. We get glimpses of this in scripture, the the worship that's taken place, the angels shouting back and forth, glory to God in the highest. There's a triumphal entry. We shouted, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They're shouting and they're praising, they're giving thanks to God because in walks the slain lamb. In walks the one who was slain before the foundations of the earth were laid. In walks the blood that that mercy seat, that the presence of God had been waiting for for all time. And there were two angels standing, blocking that way to the presence of God. 
And I believe at that moment when they saw Christ's blood, they stepped aside. And when they stepped aside, the curtain here on earth tore in two. Jesus walks into the presence of God and just sheds one drop of his blood. He could choose his hands, his side, and just lays it on that mercy seat. And sins are forgiven now and forevermore. Now, if that is not a triumphal entry, I don't know what is. Amen? Can you see it? On earth we shout Hosanna. A week later they're shouting crucify him. Jerusalem is where he entered. But his final destination was heaven on high. His final destination he knew would bring him to the cross. He knew that his blood would be shed. He knew that he would suffer. But that he would do it for you and for me. And so as we reflect this next week, as Good Friday is coming, I want to reframe for you that triumphal entry. That is what took place. He went before God Almighty with his own blood and he made atonement for us. I heard some preacher once say, a neat way to remember the word atonement or what it stands for is simply the word, at one mint. At one mint. That now God and mankind can be at one through the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what it means for Christ to make atonement, to be the atoning sacrifice so that we could have relationship with him. And some of you out there maybe have gone to church your whole life. And maybe as you're entering into this Easter season, maybe today the Holy Spirit is saying, you have not completely surrendered. You have not completely given me control of your life. And as you look at your life Maybe you see a mess or a disaster. Maybe, maybe you're following the Lord and, and you recognize these things to be true and you find great comfort in the work that Christ has done. And this is why we're preaching this passage backwards. This is what took place. This is what is true. There was an earthly temple. There was a heavenly temple. And Christ marched right on through the heavenly temple for you and for me. But the reality is, is that we are not on heaven on high. Not yet. Many of us have, have suffered loss of loved ones uh, leaving us here on earth. They're with Christ on high. I shared with a friend that their passed on loved one is more alive now than they ever have been. They're more alive now than they ever have been. Because they're home with the Lord where sin and death cannot find them ever again. But while we live here on this earth, uh, we face some storms. We face some storms of life. And I I like the book of Hebrews. Uh, And and part of what drew me to even preaching this passage was uh, whoever the writer is, is using a lot of nautical terms within this book. And so we're gonna look at a few of those nautical terms because I believe that'll help to guide us. It'll help to strengthen us as we walk through our life waiting for that day when we ourselves will enter into the presence of God. We give him praise and we thank him, but right now, Lord, we need you. We need you in a very real, very tangible way. And there's some neat little passages in here in the book of Hebrews that we're gonna dig into. The first one comes in Hebrews chapter six. Talks about this hope that we have. And it says we have a hope. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. Of course, we know what an anchor is right? An anchor is something you drop on your boat when you found your best fishing hole and you don't want to drift away from it. You want to stay right here and catch all the fish. You drop an anchor. But it's also meant for times of storms. When, when, when ships would be out at sea and a storm would come, they'd drop their anchor to keep them from rolling and tipping and drifting too fast or too far. And it would be a place where they could then kind of find some stability. But look what Jesus does. He says, we have this hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure, It enters in the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf and and has become a high priest forever. We've looked at that. There's a word in there that's forerunner. And it's an interesting word and it's used several different ways. But it's only used this one way in Scripture. 
And the way it's being used here is that word forerunner was an actual thing. It was an actual thing. There would be a boat out at sea, and there was times when there would be to be a strong storm, or for perhaps the entrance into the harbor would be one that's treacherous, it has rocks, and that's where the danger is, by the coast. When you're a big ship and you can't steer real quick, it's those big rocks that could sink you as you're trying to come into the harbor, a place of safety, a place of home. And so what they would do is they would send out a smaller boat. They would send out a smaller boat, and it would go to the big boat, and the big boat would lower its anchor into that small boat. And that small boat would take that anchor and go into the harbor, past all the rocks, guiding it, showing it how to get where it needs to be, and it would take the anchor and it would place it firmly, securely, in a cleft of a rock. Jesus is our forerunner. He took the anchor for your soul, for my soul, and he went through the curtain and he anchored your soul in heaven on high. But I'm still out at sea. I'm still out at sea. And there are storms that are in this life. The apostle Paul found himself in a storm. And there's another nautical term that comes up uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, but it's also in, in Acts chapter 27. Acts 27 actually gives us a better definition of this word. What they would do when, uh, when Paul was out at sea, and the, remember the, it talks about how the ship was getting ready to come apart? They did something which is called frapping the boat. And what they do is they'd go to the front of the boat, two people, maybe several people, whatever. They'd take a long rope, they'd throw, the, the, they'd throw it over the top of the front of the boat, it would drift under the boat, and they would hang on to the two ends. And so they, they would let the, the rope go underneath the boat, and then they would have the two ends. And then when it got to the middle, they'd tie it. And they would tie it really, really tight. They'd, they would send several of them, and they would call frapping the boat. It's basically a way, it's a last-ditch effort. It's a way for us to, to wrap ourselves, to wrap the boat, make it safe, secure, so that we can weather out the storm, so that we can weather it out. It's in that time of great distress, that time of great need, you would frap the boat. And if it got to that point, man, it was a serious event. And even Paul said, after they're frapping the boat, he says, listen, we're not going to make it through this storm. We have to scuttle the ship. And they ended up on that island. They didn't die, but they did lose the ship eventually. But that idea of frapping the boat, throwing the ropes around, undergirding it, tying it, holding it together in the midst of a horrible storm, we see this in Hebrews chapter 4. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Right here is the frapping of the boat. It says, let us, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of frapping, in our time of need. That's where that word comes in. We translate it in our time of need. In Acts, they translate it basically frapping the boat, the actual work of frapping the boat. And so what's this passage telling us? That you may be facing the storms of life, but we are to undergird ourselves with the grace and the mercy that's given to us through Christ Jesus our Lord. To wrap ourselves, to tie ourselves up. To bind ourselves to Christ Jesus. That when all else seems to be failing us in life, he never will. The grace of God will invade us on every level. It's beautiful. I love this picture. And then in Hebrews chapter 2, there is the warning. And he says, in verse 1, he says, we must, we must pay most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. 
There's that nautical term, the idea of drifting away. And so what have you heard today? That Christ with his own blood entered in triumphantly into the heavenly realms and made it so that your relationship and my relationship is secure and satisfied. He took the anchor for our soul and planted it on heaven on high. That even if we face the storms of life, we can undergird ourselves with God's grace, with his mercy, with his love. And so to me, as I sat and pondered these things and I I began to look and I thought, well, Lord, what are all these storms coming from? Because doesn't it feel like they kind of hit you and when one gets past, there's another one coming and another one coming? As soon as you give your life over to Jesus, the storms start coming. I had a friend who I was able to baptize some years ago. And I said to her, I said, listen, you are making a profession that you are uniting yourself with Christ through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. This is on display for all to see. And I said, it's on display also for the devil and his demons. I said, don't be surprised when they come to try to strip away from you the joy of your salvation. You must wrap yourself with the truth of the word of God. You must wrap yourself with a real relationship with Jesus. This person has drifted away, and it makes me sad. Do I believe that they're eternally lost? By no means, because I believe Jesus took the anchor for this person's soul and firmly planted it in heaven on high. And sometimes that's all we do feel. Life can be so hard at times that as we're drifting in the storm and it hits, there's just those little moments where God's like, no, I've got you. I've got you. It's this way. And all of a sudden we get our heading again. That's right. The anchor for my soul is in heaven on high. Another thing that comes our way is just temptations in general. There are so many things that come at us that want to tempt us to keep us away from who God wants us to be. And and I'm... I'm going to tread kind of lightly here, but at the same time, I see the devil and his work that he tries to do, and I, and I will bring this as a word. I haven't had a lot of children that have been uh, involved with sports, not a ton, uh, but I've got some, some daughters now and a couple sons, I guess, that are kind of getting interested, but, uh, but the one daughter started off, and she was interested in sports, and then we saw the schedule, and there's practices, and then there's games, and the tournaments. And man, one of the tournaments is on Sunday. It's on Sunday. Oh, I didn't know the time frame. I didn't know when it would be on Sunday, but it's scheduled to be on a Sunday. Oh man, it just kind of rubbed me a little bit. And then then I realized that's got to be the same rub for all of you parents out there who are Christian parents trying to teach your children about the things of God. To me, that is a storm of life. And you know where we where we place our time, what we place importance on, our, our children are watching. And so my, my word to you today is that if you're a parent that is having to take your children out of church on Sundays to play a sport, I just wanna give you a word of caution. In a sense, it can become idol worship. You're placing something in higher importance above God. And like I said, I want to tread lightly because we're all free to make decisions. And and yes, your walk with the Lord may be very secure. To be away on a Sunday is not going to disrupt your eternal, you know, framework. I I totally believe that. But at the same time, when I'm away from church, I feel it. You may look at the schedule and say, oh, it's only six weeks. But I feel that drifting take place when I'm away from the people of God. And I know you feel it too. That part I'm confident about. And what am I teaching my children? And so I said to my my daughter, I said, listen, if it ever comes in conflict with church, you're not playing. Right out of the gate, you're you're not playing. Because it's more important to me to set an example, to be that person for her. And I I know I probably get some emails about sports and how good they are for kids. I I understand that. But I'm looking at an eternal perspective. I don't want to see my children drift away from the things they've been taught. They're still learning. They're still growing. I didn't want to spend that much time on it because there's other storms in life. Talk about friendships. Talk about relationships. My oldest is in high school. I got a young one in elementary school. And in between, I see the impacts of relationships on my children. And they're having to come out, my older ones especially, and, and to take a stand and to actually let their friends know that they're a believer, that they're a Christian. 
And they're kind of putting those relationships on the line. And, and, and how easy it would be for them to just go along with what's really popular in society today and kind of poo-poo their Christianity. But I'm proud of them. They're letting their friends know that they are Christians and they're actually dialoguing with people who our society says that Christians want nothing to do with. And I'm going, that is such a lie. It is such a lie. So we get these cultural storms that somehow Christians are judgmental and that there's no room for people who may be struggling with things like lifestyles and, 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 and gender stuff. And it's, it's all a bunch of confusion. And I think of these, these young kids that are dealing with these storms in life, which even adults can't understand and explain, and yet it's invading them at an early age. And so I've been instructing my kids to tell them, hey, man, just be a kid. Just be a kid. Adults can't figure this stuff out. And then I've instructed them too to say, you know, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says I'm to put on love towards people. That by loving people who aren't like me, they'll begin to know who my Heavenly Father is. They'll begin to know who my Savior is, who is the anchor for my soul, the one who has guided me into the harbor of heaven, the one in whom I am following on this earth. No matter what storm comes my way, I am following that tug of heaven. And we know when something's trying to drift us away, it can be your work. And it affects young and old, and it's, it, it, could be, it could be your work. It's trying to drift you away. You know, I've never had an employer come back to me and say, hey, thanks for all those years of hard work. But boy, in the moment, they really want you there. Every, you know, boom, 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 pound it out. Close on Friday, open on Saturday, get back at it, work, work, work. Oh, I got to be there. I got to show up. My boss is counting on me. Not one of them's come back and said, thanks, not one. But you know who feels neglected? My children. They remember that. I've reframed how I work. So the storms of life that come, but it's that tug of heaven that keeps drawing us back to him. You know, there's even a name too. There's a name. You know, there's, a, there's that rope or that chain that's connected to that anchor. That anchor is our soul. He's planted it in heaven on high. But there's a gap, right? There's that, that gap from the anchor to your soul. And it's for a boat, it's connected with a rope or a chain. You know what it is connected for us? It's the word of faith. It's the word faith. That's what connects us to our soul, is to have faith in who Jesus says who he is. That when the angels saw his blood, they stepped aside and they said, come right on in. This blood we recognize. And we get to experience life everlasting. It's not how strong my faith is. It's my faith in that God is who he says he is. It says that he has taken me and he has anchored me in heaven on high. Other parts of scripture talk about, says, says how we are hidden with Christ on high. That's what I believe is that what he says to me is true. My strength of faith can wax and wane, but his faithfulness to me will always be true. He will never leave me. He will never forsake me. No matter what storms of life I may face, no matter what difficulties may come, when I feel like I'm breaking apart, it's the grace of God that binds me together. Sometimes that's all I have. So Good Friday's coming. And I want you to reflect on these things. Come here and join us if you can. But this week, I want you to be intentional with your walk with the Lord. Just tell him thanks. Have some gratitude. Just pause for a moment. Like like Eric was instructing us today, just just sit in in a moment and pause and just be thankful. Even if you're in the midst of a storm, Jesus shows the picture how in the storms of his life, he fell asleep in the back of the boat. I want to have that kind of calm in my life when I'm facing the storm. I can only get there because of the work of Jesus. Amen? We're going to stand and sing one last song. The song is Cornerstone, and it's got some good nautical themes in there. So may this carry you through the rest of the week. 
I'm gonna close in prayer now, but when the song is over, you're simply dismissed. And so thank you for those who are tuning in on the internet. God bless you all. You may be faced with storms of life and there's a way for you to connect with our pastors online. You got a neat feature when you can just... You can just go into a chat and say, I'm facing a storm in life and I need prayer. We've got pastors right now at the computer that are willing to pray for you. Can I just see a show of hands? How many in here are dealing with storms in life right now? Come on. This is encouraging to us because we're all, I'm dealing with them. I've got two storms, okay? And there's no shame in that because I have an anchor for my soul. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you. In Jesus' name, we want to thank you for the faith we can have in your faithfulness to us, that your blood was sufficient, that we could have relationship with you, that our soul, the anchor for our soul is placed in heaven on high. We thank you, we praise you. We thank you, Lord, now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.